Good morning. Welcome uh, to this keynote session, uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce Kevin Highland. Just a uh, very quick word, just to take you back and give you some context. Six or seven years ago, I started talking to the government about the need for transparency in supply chain legislation and was met with a very firm no. Here we are six or seven years later, and it's a very different world. It's two years since the Modern Slavery Act, one year since the full first cycle of implementation of transparency in supply chain legislation. And I think we'd all agree that it's the crown jewel in the Modern Slavery Act. So this morning, Kevin is going to talk about what its impact has been. Um, and so would you welcome to the podium Kevin Highland, the UK's first independent anti-slavery commissioner. Good morning. And, um, Thank you for inviting me for speaking here today to open this summit. Um, as was mentioned, ahead of tomorrow, uh, which is Anti-Slavery Day. So it's very important that we consider what this issue is. And the ability that business community has to curb modern slavery cannot and must not be underestimated and must not be underutilized. The complexity of monitoring global supply chains is huge but so is the resource, power, and sway that the business community has. And amid all the complexity, there is one absolute certainty that we can all agree on, and that is that slave labor should not and must not exist in the United Kingdom or anywhere in the world. The kind of exploitation currently occurring in supply chains globally cannot anymore be accepted as business as usual for our contemporary society. Today, it is debt, desperation, and fear, not guns and chains which trap millions into slavery. Today, it's estimated that there are 40 million people globally in slavery worldwide, and the government estimated at least 13,000 in the UK, which is now seen as probably a very conservative estimate. And at least 16 million of these 40 million are in lives of forced labor and likely to be in the supply chains of products that many of us rely on and many of you even sell. So how can the global economy or any business be dependent on the exploitation of fellow mankind? We need huge cultural change. And this may seem like an enormous challenge, but as the Modern Slavery Act is an example of itself, change can happen quickly. If you had told me five years ago that we would have a modern slavery act in the UK, let alone one that was so far reaching, I don't think I could have believed that. Just over two years later, the modern slavery act was passed and Andrew spoke about how that came about. So change can happen quickly. We must remember that it took William Wilberforce just 20 years to end the British slave trade and it was less than 30 years more when the global slave trade was abolished. And that's at a time when slavery was legal, when it was death. It was birth, marriage, and death. It was there at every part of your life. So I want to start on a positive note that with the right minds, motivations, and mechanisms, we can change and improve the lives of workers across the globe. Across sectors, we must listen and learn from each other. After all, that is how the transparency in the supply chain elements came around. In the draft of the legislation, it did not include, include a cause, a clause of the bill at all. And it was civil society, businesses, and many people in this room, including Andrew Wallace, who lobbied tirelessly for its inclusion. But of course, the act was just the start. The kind of structural and cultural change that is needed cannot simply be achieved by the passing of legislation but must be driven from within business itself by leaders such as yourselves. What legislation does do, however, is open conversation and provide business with the motivation and the mandate to act. The Modern Slavery Act, which requires all large businesses operating in the UK to annually publish a modern slavery statement, was just the start. In February 2017, France adopted legislation that requires certain companies to develop vigilance plans to identify and prevent adverse human rights impacts. 
February also saw the Dutch Parliament adopt a child labour due diligence bill. Switzerland, too, is currently considering similar legislation with a referendum on mandatory human rights due diligence. And the Australian government have announced its intention to pass their own modern slavery models on the UK's particular focus on transparency in supply chains. The trend for business and human rights regulation is clearly on an upward trajectory, and the issue of slavery, quite rightly, remains firmly in the spotlight. Companies stuck in the mindset of what's the minimum I need to do are not only putting human lives at risk, but are also missing out on opportunities to use ethical business practices as a competitive edge. Operating ethically and operating profitably do not need to be mutually exclusive. And in fact, the business case for ethical supply chains is incredibly strong. And this case is only going to be strengthened in the years to come as global communications take hold and consumers and society are increasingly able to hold companies to account. Whilst the cost of a thorough auditing process may seem prohibitive in the short term, the long-term benefits of a well-designed process will almost always pay off. Nobody here believes that anyone should be enslaved. Yet, too often in the past, people have taken an approach of what I don't know can't hurt me. This simply is not acceptable in today's world. The words of William Wilberforce, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never say again that you did not know. That is relevant now. We know that this is happening. We know that slavery exists, and we are gaining a better and better understanding of what the vulnerabilities are and where the risks lie. Now is the time to act. Rather than recount the problems, we should start to look at the practical solutions. A number of companies have recognized that subcontracting out to recruitment agencies heighten the risks of inadvertently profiting from slave labor. Patagonia, for example, found that migrant workers in their supply chain were subject to long hours, low wages, and enormous broker fees, which kept them in debt bondage. They subsequently implemented a policy stating that suppliers can no longer require migrant workers to pay broker fees to secure a job, which will prevent workers from ending up in debt bondage. A French construction firm working in Qatar identified that 93% of their workers had paid recruitment fees. Workers employed through some contractors were paying recruitment fees as high as two to three years salaries. This meant that the workers were paying for years on end with no pay for themselves and were enslaved. A dedicated resource director within that company vowed to change those processes and they implemented processes whereby the contracts were managed so that that couldn't happen. However, they said it was difficult on a case-by-case -case basis, and they put the argument forward that if this was across the industries, it would be effective. So we need to see the change. We need to see a way so that contractors and recruiters are actually doing what they need to do to make sure people are not exploited. But only if firms join together and agree on a collective policy to abolish recruitment fees would some contractors and recruitment firms actually be successful. And this is not just happening far away in Qatar. I've had similar discussions with ABP Foods here in the UK. They have tried similar schemes, more direct recruitment, working with recruitment agencies to improve conditions, offering language classes, but they are consistently coming across resource challenges. Collective action and corporate leadership is absolutely crucial. However hard dedicated HR directors, CSR teams, and responsible sourcing managers are working to improve labor practices, it is simply not possible to make any real change unless the resources behind it and unless business models are restructured. I want you to think about where the modern slavery agenda fits in your company. When slavery is embedded in supply chains, it cannot be offset with CSR work. It needs to be looked at more holistically. Change needs to be driven from the top and be part of the business strategies 
not just a social responsibility tick box ex exercise. On that note, what impact has modern slavery statements had so far? Are companies treating them as a mere tick box compliance exercise? Since the passing of the Act, research by a UK's leading business school has found that engagement of CEOs with modern slavery issues has doubled and 50% more companies are seeking external advice and expertise. CEOs are realising that addressing modern slavery is becoming a business critical issue for credibility with customers, investors and the general public. Undoubtedly, companies are now engaging more openly than ever before and are tackling the issue head on developing toolkits, running trading programs, and introducing agreements with suppliers. The requirement of sign-off from the board has helped secure the necessary engagement and ownership from senior leadership. While the Modern Slavery Act has pushed the topic of modern slavery into the boardroom, and a number of companies are making good progress, analysis of statements published so far that the, shows that the quality of statements remains weak. Many are failing to actually meet the, re the minimum standards, let alone provide any in-depth analysis of their supply chains. Companies need to be digging deeper and understanding their industry-specific risks. What commodities are higher risk? Which operating regions pose a greater risk to modern slavery? Why is this the case? What is the company doing to mitigate the risk? These are the kinds of questions that companies should be asking and that their modern slavery statements should be answering. Many statements have shown positive steps, including the training of staff on modern slavery and additional due diligence in procurement. Whilst this is good and indeed essential for staff to have training in identifying modern slavery, prevention is of course better than cure. It is absolutely vital that companies look closely at their business models and analyze their purchasing practices. They need to consider whether their business model is enabling modern slavery to enter their supply chain and work to reform their practices if it is found to do so. Businesses should also be looking at the risks related to supply. What is the socio-political context of the region that your workforce operate in? Is there a large migrant population? Are labor regulations weak? The reason that Bangladesh, Pakistan, Haiti and Cambodia, for example, have been growing factory hubs in the past decades is not related to an abundance of natural resources. Rather, it is related to the fact that they have suffered conflict, disaster and political turmoil and are home to an impoverished labour force who are vulnerable and have limited options to support themselves. In countries with weaker regulations, the workers with no unions or protection systems in need of any work are forced to deal with highly flexible and often exploitative working conditions. Many of these risks associated with both supply and demand are not unique to individual companies. A lot of you here will be facing the very same challenges. The quality of statements and indeed the actions on the ground can be improved enormously if companies facing similar risks pull their resources to understand how better to mitigate those very risks. I therefore want to encourage you to work with your industry and work with relevant trade bodies and non-government organisations to enhance your anti-slavery efforts. Just yesterday, my second annual report was laid before Parliament and covers some of the good work but also some of the challenges with the private sector, which is one of my five priority areas of my strategy. And as I've stated in my report, many small but impactful changes have been made by the business sector, both nationally and internationally. But more needs to be done. And also, what's important is this is not an insurmountable problem. It just requires dedicated individuals such as yourselves challenging certain practices and working to change them to promote human freedom. I expect that this time next year, at this summit, companies will be discussing the progress that they have made. And for this to happen, it needs people like me to stop talking, but it needs people like you to start talking to each other.
The stakes are high because this is about human suffering. But by us all coming together and having trust, respect and humility, we have got an opportunity to eradicate modern slavery from your supply chains, not just in the UK, but also globally. Thank you very much. So we have a few minutes uh, for questions. Uh, I'm not quite sure if Slido is going to work or not. You, you can put your questions there. So while, whilst you're logging in and uh, getting your brains into gear, Maybe as, as moderator, I can ask the first question, and then we'll, we'll throw it open to the floor. Uh, so, Kevin, a couple of times you said like the, the business model has has got to change. Uh, what for you does that look like? And often in business, we talk about this shift from good to great. And 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 at the end, you said you know you wanted to come back next year, and and there would be this discussion amongst business. Can you um, unpack that a little bit more? Sure. So, um, I think. One of the things that we need to see with the Modern Slavery Act and with the statements is it needs to be the companies themselves that take responsibility. It's not about calling somebody in who's going to change your model. You know how your business operates. Your companies are very complex. Uh, you know, I'm working with some of the biggest companies that are in, the, you know, that there are global companies. Um, and they may have hundreds of thousands of suppliers. But actually, every time you engage on some product, you have a process whether it's procurement, whether it's HR, whether it's quality control. And you need to engage holistically across your resources to have modern slavery in those processes. And I'll give you an example for it, you know, on a statutory side, I'm working with the NHS and they are now going to incorporate this in their commissioning, I hope. So within three years, it will be part of their business as usual. So if you can get this into your business as usual, um, then we will see that change globally. But I think one of the important things that I want to see and I think it's essential that the Modern Slavery Act isn't actually punitive, unless you don't do a statement. But it's, it's not punitive about the quality of your statement. And that was deliberate, because what we want companies to do is to go out and look for it, and when you find it, put it right. Don't be fearful that perhaps somewhere in your supply chain, whether it's in Southeast Asia or whether it's in the Midlands, that you may have exploitation. If you find it and correct it, that's what we want to see. And I know there may be a fear about reputational damage that may come from that, but actually I want the position to be where you can openly say we looked and we found and we put it right, because that's when we will get the change, the cultural change, as opposed to the change that comes because of fear of being prosecuted. Great. Um, nothing has appeared on my screen, so either you're all locked out or... Uh you're being slightly coy in coming forward. So I'm, I'm going to open it to the floor. Are there any questions? I wonder if, when you frame your question, if you could just say your name and the organization that you represent. Yeah. Uh, there's a mic coming as well, so we can all hear you. Hi, good morning. I'm Kanish Negi from ABB. Uh, my question is, some of the countries uh, do legalize the employment fees, uh, especially in Southeast Asia. And it's extremely, extremely difficult in those geographies because there is a legal protection when the guys uh, ask or the supplier ask for these fees from the migrant laborers. And also when we try to uh, kind of bring about a change, uh, it's, it's, it's extremely difficult to bring that mindset shift. Uh, what would your be recommendation uh, to deal with such issues on, in such places? So companies have a great uh, uh, influence in those regions and firstly you know when you are negotiating um, you can make a commercial decision that you're not going to do that you know just because that may be a, a legal allowance in that area doesn't mean you have to agree with it you don't have to as I've given examples of you know in those regions that I was talking about there is legal you know there are legal uh, brokers who operate and we do know that some are operated by states themselves in certain parts of the world so but you as a company you know, you're not obliged to do that. But actually, if all the companies agreed and came up with a policy that you're not going to allow those to happen, whether it's part of their legal structures or not, I know it gets more difficult when you have areas and countries that say, uh, you know, we're going to supply a workforce that travels, and there are countries in Southeast Asia, for example, that have that as a policy. Um, that's more difficult, and that's where I work with governments and foreign governments to see how we can work on that. That's why we need Australia involved and other parts of the world. But as companies, you do make your decisions. Um, and if collectively 
you all said we're not going to trade in that area, or we are. For example, ASEM, where there's tea. I'm working with the British Asian Trust to see how we can influence better buying of tea. Now, the tea purchasers in the UK and the biggest buyers do want to pay a little bit more. But on the ground, there's a push down saying, well, we don't really want you to pay more because you're going to release all these people that are going to then be uncontrollable, perhaps. So I know it's difficult, but actually you need to push in a certain direction. And there are changes that you can make. And if your strategy in your uh, supply chain statement considers that, I understand, and I think all, everybody understands the challenges you face, because I don't want you to just pull out of those areas, because that will make it even worse. So it's kind of having that mature conversation, that open conversation that is transparent. Transparency is probably everything. I know there's some commercial considerations you will always have. But if businesses and sectors and industries have those conversations more openly, I think we will start to achieve that. Not overnight, might take five years, might take longer, but I think that slow push will work. Great, and look at that. Uh, slider has come to, to life magically. Um, I'm going to jump to the second question. I mean, both of, uh, we'll come back to the top question in a minute, but why do you think, Kevin, that so many companies are just sort of aiming for compliance and, and not beyond as you were advocating in, 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 your, in your talk? So I think we've got to accept it's only year one. So it's kind of, um, when this first came in last year, um, there was a raft of people who could solve this almost overnight. Um, and we ne we're now getting into a more mature position. Um, it's only a year on. So companies, you know, I had a lot of CEOs come to me. I, had, I attended a lot of board meetings and some of the biggest companies. And there was just a whole raft of issues coming into them. You know, a day wouldn't go by without another offer, another solution. Now I think we're getting to the position where it's companies need to change, drive this. You know, companies are very well resourced. You know, you wouldn't have an outsider come in and do, well, you would have an outsider, but a very highly qualified outsider come in and do your accounts, do your quality control. So you need to work more collectively. So I think what happened, it was rabbits in the headlights, perhaps. Um, we're now starting to see a more mature discussion. Um, but I think there is also this tendency, of course, the high street brands are always going to be in the spotlight. But of the you know, 12 to 15,000 companies, how many are not high street brands? And they're the ones that we need to look at to see that they're doing their compliance. So I think there was a bit of fear. I think there was a bit of worry. I think they thought that there would be a solution that may come one size fits all. But I think now the discussions, because it's in the boardroom, because people are calling, to it, calling these issues to account, because we're getting some quality assurance, we are starting to see the progress. But I think next year, you know, I would like to see 100% uh, of the companies that should report reporting. Um, so Anonymous is getting very active uh, on Slido. Um, and Anonymous would like to know what uh, advice would you offer to SMEs who lack the resources of the larger companies to deal with this, um, but when, you know, uh, are obviously touched by this because of the trickle-down effect uh, from larger companies, but, but what can they do to tackle this? Sure, and this is where some of the discussions have to be. And if you look at, you know, uh, there was an SME in, in uh, the north of England whereby they were manufacturing for one of our major companies, for Next and John Lewis, uh, and they had slavery in their business. So they had people who were making the beds for these companies, but the slavery was actually in that business. Um, so the director of that company was actually held to account for the criminal offences because he saw it in front of him and should have responded. But I think, you know, if we're talking about on the ethical side, um, yes, the big companies will come and say we want A, B, C, D to happen, and can the SME afford that? Well, I think that what we need to do is that that's part of the conversations that need to be addressed, is that we can't have a model whereby it's always the big companies that's driving the cost down, because that cost will always end up with the person who's working in the field or the factory. So we need to change that conversation piece, because if we really want this... You know, the Home Secretary headed up a meeting last week which was a, a, about business leaders. And, you know, the discussions are in those spaces that if you really want to have a supply chain that ha doesn't have slavery, you need to look at the final person. If you are paying enough in your supply chain for that person at the end to be paid the minimum wage and to work properly, then that's an audit process. Um, you know, we do it on other things, or companies do it on other things. The quality of something, you know how good your minerals are that might come from somewhere in Africa. But do you actually know about the worker and they're getting paid the right amount? And then what is the policing methods or the monitoring or auditing? So SMEs need to turn it back a little bit, which I know is difficult, 
I will actually speak to the big companies, and I think we should, to say, actually, if you are forcing it right down to that bottom person, that worker in a field, because that figure can never pay that figure, then we have to call those companies to account. So there is a bit of an open conversation. But also, SMEs can't just push it up. They need to look at their own business as well. Um, they have to comply with health and safety. They have to comply with insurance compliance. They have to do tax returns. Well, actually, you can do all this within those structures as well. It's not always this is so difficult and we've got to employ lots more resources. It's about what you embed in your current structures. And that applies to the biggest companies and to some of the smaller companies. Uh, so we're running out of time and enough questions from Anonymous. Um, there's a question in, in the front. I just, I'm curious where you see that uh, the sustainability assessments that are there, you know, there are many sustainability initiatives around in different industries where there is also an important social chapter. So where do you feel that is falling short versus the modern slavery, slavery act in identifying the, the gaps and addressing those? So if we look at sustainability, what does it look at? You know, what are you actually looking at? Are you looking at sustainability of the product or sustainability of the finances, uh, sustainability of development, or do you ever consider the sustainability of the communities and the environment? Um, you know, and I, I think that's the bit that's missed. Um, you know, I've met with CEOs who've said, you know, we buy minerals. Do you really expect us to be able to inspect the mines? I said, yeah, I do. You actually go there and do all sorts of other inspections, um, but I do expect you to look at the workforce. Um, and recently, when I was interviewed by Radio 4, when Sports Direct got found to have slave labour in their factories in Derbyshire, I was said, you know, I was asked, do you really expect companies to be able to mon manage and monitor this? And I said, well, this is serious and organised crime. If there was women being assaulted, if there were sexual offences, if there was drug dealing in that factory or in that warehouse, we'd expect a response and we'd expect the company to do something about it. So I think also we need to recognise this isn't just a business malpractice, this isn't just an audit issue, it's serious organised criminals who are infiltrating your business. So I think when we talk about sustainability, what are we talking about? Is it just about profit? Is it just about the business growth? Is it just about the product? Sustainability has to include human lives and communities. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, and in, uh, because I know what will happen is if we overrun, it will eat into your coffee time, and then you'll get grumpy. So would you join me in thanking Kevin for an informative speech this morning? Thank you.